to please remind me where we stopped last time. We, we defined, uh, we, we, we have a spectral definition of control, right? But we didn't uh, discuss the construction of the convolutional neural network yet. So just, just as a reminder, we are talking about uh, extending the notion of the convolutional neural network to non euclidean domain. So we, we did uh, three steps to build such an extension. So one step, I just showed you a very brief reminder of what uh, what the top list operator is basically what uh, what shift or translation equivalence means. Basically, we define a linear operator that is commutative with any uh, basically with it, with the action of the translation group, and we saw that uh, such operators. Uh, because, because of the fact they commute with any, uh, basically with all the translations, all these operators have the same eigenbasis. And this eigenbasis was uh, given by, by the complex exponentials. And the transformation the basis, basically trans transforming from the standard Euclidean basis to, the, to this eigenbasis was, uh, we called it the Fourier transform. Right? So basically, the Fourier transform is the same, the same transformation diagonalizes all. Uh, all top list operators in Euclidean domains. Then we've seen two examples of non-Euclidean domains, many of them graphs. And basically the, the main the main difference was that we had to work locally, to work with uh, local tangent spaces that are still equipped with with the uh, with the geometry with, with, the, with an inner product that we call the the, the Riemannian metric that uh, allows to measure uh, distances and angles locally. And then basically we extended notions from calculus, the notion of the differential gradient, divergence, and the classium to uh, basically to this new construction of the non-Euclidean domain. And specifically a Laplacian, like any derivative operator in the Euclidean domain, it's a shift in vacuum, or better better say a translation equivalent. It commutes with the action of the translation group. It means that, for example, the Laplacian would be diagonalized by the Fourier transform in the Euclidean domain. Now, uh, so on the Euclidean domain, it's just one of the possible top list operators that we can, we can apply. Uh, and we took the Laplacian of the non Euclidean domain and just declared that we'll take its eigen, eigenbasis as our uh, equivalent of the Fourier transform. So we define the Fourier transform as projection onto this orthonormal eigenbasis. Show you very briefly that the Laplacian has, uh, has an autonomic eigenbasis, has a real and uh, non negative eigenvalues. And basically, we define this we have transform. So we have, uh, we have a, a scalar field or a vertex field that is defined in our, in our domain. And if we have transform of this field, is simply a sequence of inner products of this one. And of course, the phi i's are the eigenfunctions or the eigenvectors of the Laplace. Okay. So specifically, if we are talking about the graph Laplace, and it was very convenient to represent this as an n by n matrix, and is the uh, is the size of the graph, the number of vertices in the vertex set, and then we can simply write this eigen decomposition. This way, right? okay. So the inverse transform, of course, so th this operation was called the nice. So the inverse transform would, uh, uh, they would just reverse this direction. The inverse transform will take this sequence of real coefficients, right? We call this half hat. Right? This, this sequence we call it half hat. So the inverse transform will take half hat and construct again a, a vertex field or a star field, depending, depending whether we are talking about the graph or a mental in the standard uh, Euclidean. 
Okay. So in, in the matrix notation, this. So if if we are talking about a graph, right? So in, in the matrix notation, if we are talking about a graph, we can think of the field as a vector in R n. Okay. And then f hat, the analysis operation, the forward to form, can simply be seen as phi transpose f, right? Because these are all the inner products of the columns, which are the eigenvector, with the analyzed signal f. And the forward transform is simply given this is basically just a matrix vector product. This is phi f. And you can see the orthonormality of the basis. Is very is evident here because the inverse is just the transpose. Okay, so these are real, uh, these are real, real vectors. So it's transpose without complex coding. Okay, so basically this was our construction of the of the uh, of the Fourier transform on non Euclidean domains. And then again, remembering from what we have in the uh, Euclidean domain, in the Euclidean domain we could say simply that f convolution with g could be seen as the inverse transform of the transform of f element wise product with the transform of g okay we call this we call this the convolution theorem but actually it is just a direct consequence of the fact that the free transform diagonalizes the operator okay and basically both sides were defined well on uh, on the Euclidean domain we define convolution in a certain way as a complex operator, and then we've seen that this is an equivalent way of defining convolution. These are basically it's an if and only if state, right? You can write the complex operator this way in the standard basis or this way in the free basis. Now, on the non-Euclidean domain, this part is not defined. We don't know what the topless operator means in the non-Euclidean domain. However, however, this part is, is well defined, so we can define. On a non-Euclidean domain, we can simply define f convolution. So let me write. Okay, let me write the convolution g. Write it this way. So they, I will write it in matrix notation. It will be phi. Right. This, this is the inverse transform uh, multiplied by. I will have an element-wise product of two vectors. Right? So I will just write another more product. I transpose f. Adamar product with five transpose G. And Adamar product is just an element wise product of, uh, of that. It's like dot star. You know? Okay? And basically, this is the way we define convolution on a graph or on a, on a menu. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. the number of the uh, points on the. The size of the vertex set of the graph. So, in the way we define it, uh, the coefficients are changing whenever you are taking and I mean, it should, it should be normalized by the area somehow because in this way, uh, I mean, with this definition, if you take, I don't know, uh, you, you, you down sample uh, the surface or something like this. Sure. Yeah. A, a no, of, of course, of course. So you remember our definition of the Laplacian. So, so first of all, the Laplacian of a graph can be a very abstract node. Can be a, a purely topological notch, you know, not necessarily anything that has to do with, with geometry. However, we had uh, edge weights and uh, vertex weights. So these vertex weights, one over uh, AI that we had in the, in the definition of the Laplacian, if you want to, if you want your graph to represent some geometric entity, for example, a sample discretized version of a manifold, these A's would exactly correspond to a discretized uh, volume form, right? It would be basically in the areas. So the is already exactly. 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 So, so this is not the way uh, it is dealt with, uh, for example, in computational geometry. Usually, the areas go into the definition of the inner products. However, I think it's easier to uh, to deal with uh, with the regular Euclidean unweighted uh, inner products and introduce the, the weighting if it is necessary to the process. Okay. I mean, both ways are valid as soon as we remember what we're doing. Okay. So, so basically, this is the way we define convolution. Okay. So let me now uh, let me now define some equivalent of or some uh, some rough analog, which is not exactly equivalent uh, of a topless operator. So let let me call it W, because I would like 
I would like to construct a convolutional neural network that is parameterized by these filters W, right? So I, this is where uh, this is where I would like to get. So this is a system W or an operator W, linear operator W that acts on uh, on some signal f. So a signal for us, instead of being just a sequence on some uh, d-dimensional grid, now it is a vertex field uh, on a graph. Okay. So let me let me stick to the to the uh, notion of the, of a graph as our domain because I would like to work with everything discrete. Of course, we can also think of this graph as the discretization of some many, but we, we, at this point we need to work discreetly. Uh, so this will be given by phi. Again, I'm just copying what is written here, phi. And here I will have a diagonal matrix W hat, which is this. Because it's diagonal, I don't have uh, another more product anymore. I just have a matrix vector product times phi transpose f. Phi transpose f is the, are the free coefficients, right? And it's the coordinates of the of the of the vector f of the field f in the Fourier basis. Okay. So now let me think about this operator. Let me call it W. Okay. It's an n by n matrix that expresses the action of this operator in the original space domain on the vertices of the graph. Okay? So if I think of each row of this of this uh, uh, matrix W, each row of this matrix W, basically undergoes an inner product with F. So you can think of these rows as some kind of patterns that we are placing around each vertex and computing inner products with F. Okay? So convolution did the same. In case of convolution, it was the same pattern with which we just translated on uh, on our Euclidean domain. Now here on the graph, we don't even have the properly defined notion of a translation. So that, that these might be different templates and different locations of the graph, but we are still essentially doing the same operation. We are computing inner products with those templates. Okay, and those templates are parameterized by these diagonal matrix. So this diagonal matrix I can write it as diagonal. W hat one until W hat n. Okay, these are the degrees of freedom in my uh, in my definition of the operator. Yes. What is the motivation behind delivering the phi and W? Well, I have to. I want to define something that, that looks like convolution. And on the Euclidean domain, I can equivalently define convolution in space or in frequency, right? In the standard basis or in the Fourier basis. Uh, on a non-Euclidean domain, I, I, I still have this definition valid, and this is something completely unknown, right? undefined. So I just defined convolution of two fields to be equal to this, to the, to the spectral definition, to the frequency. Okay? And basically, it amounts to, to this linear operator that I can still define in the, in the space domain, but it is parameterized by the, by the frequency parameters. Okay? So the, before our convolution was defined by some spatial template, now it is defined by some frequency response. Okay, so before the size of the number of degrees of freedom that uh, that these operators had was constant, independent on the size of the domain. Now it does depend on the size of the domain, which which is a problem because we have many more degrees of freedom than we would usually have in convolutional neural network, and we do want to keep the number of degrees of freedom controlled to in order to avoid overfitting. Okay. So we'll see how to deal with this problem in, in, in a few minutes. But basically, this defines this defines uh, this defines convolution essentially, right? So once we have convolution or some generalized no notion of convolution, let's now define a convolution uh, a convolution layer of a neural network. Once we have a convolution layer, we can build a neural network. Yes. Can you connect this to the idea of weight? Is w is the same as of the weight matrix, so it's some No, no, it's a completely different. I mean, I'm using the same. I'm using the same notion. But basically, once we have constructed the Laplacian, I don't care about the weights of the graph anymore. Okay, so maybe it's maybe it's a bad notation, but it's not the same matrix at all. So, how it will relate to the weight later on? It will not. I mean, it is constructed yeah. indirectly from the weights, but it's not. It's not directly related. So basically, from the weights of the graph. So the weights of the graph are given. Okay. One 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 important point. So this definition is basis dependent, right? So I, I, if I fix this w w hat and I perturb my domain a little bit in such a way that the Laplacian is perturbed a little bit, consequently the eigendecomposition is perturbed, right? So the basis changes. 
Now the same W, WH will potentially give a completely different filter in the spatial domain. Okay? So when, consequently, if I try to learn something on one graph and then apply it to even a, even a similar looking graph, it will not generalize well. Okay? Because, it, because this construction is basically dependent. So it is, a, it is a major limitation of these constructions, of course. But if your problem, if in your problem we can assume that the domain is fixed and you just learn how to uh, analyze signals on that fixed domain, that this construction is fine. Okay? It's perfectly suitable. Yes? What is W, 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 W,
So in, in, the, in the Euclidean domain, the Laplacian was just one of the topless operators. Now I'm picking the Laplacian. I know how to construct it on manifolds and on graphs. I'm using this eigen decomposition to define the Fourier basis. Different operators would give, give different bases. And different in non Euclidean domain. And phi is not allowed because it's so phi is defined based on your non Euclidean space. Exactly. Phi, phi, is, phi is basically the future of the space. Okay? So I, for phi is, phi is not learned. There is an interesting question exactly related to, to this ba basically to this uh, basis dependence. So if I have, for example, two domains that are different, I can actually find some kind of joint eigenbasis. It will not be perfectly an eigenbasis because usually these, these two Laplacians will not commute. But if I have correspondence between the domains, I can compute using that correspondence some kind of an approximate joint eigenbasis, basically by doing approximate joint diagonalization of the two Laplacians. And then, basically, the, the two Fourier transforms will be compatible. Their, their Fourier coefficients will be, will be coupled in some way. But this is a slightly more advanced topic. So Basically, you're presuming something, when you have five, you're presuming something on your table. You're presuming you know the dynamic Yes, 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 of course. So, so, it, it's it, not simple, uh, so, so, so this is the distinction that I, I tried to make uh, uh, when we started the, the, uh, treating this argument. There are two fundamentally different problems. One of them is learning. Uh, basically, there is learning of non-Euclidean domains versus learning on non-Euclidean domains. So what we did with unsupervised learning was in, 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 it was essentially learning of a non-Euclidean domain. Right? We wanted to find some manifold structure in, in our data, some latent manifold. Right? So discovering this manifold is learning of a non-Euclidean uh, domain. Now, a completely different setting is where you have some domain. Let's say you have a Facebook graph. You have some signals on this graph, some kind of attributes that are associated with the nodes, maybe with the, with the edges. And you would like to do to learn some patterns, for example, that that uh, uh, let's say they, that distinguish one community uh, from on a social graph. Uh, so learning on this domain and taking into account uh, its smoothness, for example, and other geometric properties is a completely different set of problem. So basically, doing signal processing on the graph is uh, is something that we are dealing with, and we would like to introduce elements of learning. So it's not just doing signal processing. So basically, until here it was signal processing. When we start learning these coefficients, we are doing basically deep learning on the graph. Okay? So basically, this, uh, this is our uh, basic ingredient. This is a convolutional layer. Of course, we stack a few of them, and we get the CNN. Okay? So basically, this is a spectral construction of a CNN. Now, pay, pay attention that the complexity or the number of the number of parameters, so let's not talk about complexity yet, but the number of degrees of freedom that we have here is n times m times m prime, right? So it does depend, it, is lin it depends linearly on the size of the domain, which is cardinally different from the uh, Euclidean CNN, where the domain size was completely irrelevant to the number of degrees of freedom of the layer. The degrees of freedom of the layer, of course, depended on the input and the output dimension, times some constant, the size of the filter, but not on the, on the size of the domain. I could apply the same CNN to a small image and uh, to 32 megapixel image, and the number of degrees of freedom would remain the same. Okay? Here, it's not the case. Okay, so one more ingredient that uh, that we had, I, I would like to mention it here as well. So we also had the, the idea of a strided convolution field. So basically, in our in most of our definitions of convolutional layers, we actually so basically this is how our convolutional layer looked like. We had sum over i. I'm writing it in the same notation: w i j convolution with x i. And then we had this downsampling operation. Let's write it with some index p in the d-dimensional case p that is actually the vector, telling us basically how many samples to skip in every direction of the grid. Okay? So basically this was the definition of this kind of convolution. So essentially uh, this thing mapped, it was a downsampling operation, right? It took us from Zd to some basically scale version of Zd, pi 1 to pi b Zd, 
right? Because, you know, we skip every PIs. Uh, we had a we had a, a diluted grid, a core, a core set grid, and P P can be a different number in every dimension. We said that we usually will keep the same the same stride size in every dimension when working with an image, for example. Okay. So when we try to generalize this idea to a graph, we necessarily need to deal with some kind of graph course, right? So basically, here we have two dom domains, essentially. The input domain and the output domain are not the same. We have ZB in the input domain and some course in ZB in the output domain. Of course, we can always rescale the output domain in such a way that it again looks like ZB. It is not the case of a graph. So in case of a graph, we have some graph, let's say, G. With, uh, with, let's say, n vertices, and we have the Laplacian, right? We have the Laplacian, the corresponding eigenfunctions phi, the corresponding eigenvalues lambda, right? So this is one graph G. And suppose we have another graph G, G tiled, uh, G, uh, G tiled with n tiled equal to some alpha n, alpha is smaller than one, some, let's say, down downsampling factor. We have the corresponding Laplacian of this domain with the corresponding eigenfunctions, corresponding eigenvalues. Okay. So just to keep the same notation, let's think of an operator. Let's call it down something by this factor of alpha that takes takes us from graph G to graph G L, and basically it simply maps. Uh, it simply maps vertices of one graph to the vertices of the other graph. Okay. So in this notation, in this notation, we will essentially need to modify this operator, right? Now, what is important is that uh, when we are talking about the Laplacian. The following, the following multi-resolution relation holds the property. So the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian of the course and the main correspond to the course and eigenfunctions of the original domain times this projection of rate. Okay, this is alpha. Okay, so so this so this operation so the, Think of it this way. This is a matrix. This is an n cap, so n tiled by n tiled uh, matrix. This is an n by n matrix. We can think of this as an n tiled by n matrix, right? This map, okay? And this this operator, this projection operator, ta takes us from takes us from n tiled to n, right? So so this is very simple. This just selects. Uh, subset of the rows of this matrix, right? Now this operation selects the first uh, n-tiled frequencies, the lowest frequencies, and zeros the rest. Okay. So basically, it essentially means that you are performing some some so you, perf you are performing some filtering in the frequency domain, but you are just keeping the low pass, the lowest frequencies of that of that filter, and then you subsample the vertices of its spatial realization. Yes. So, if for example, alpha and half, then well, it's, it has to be. Yeah, it has to be. Yeah, it has to be one. I mean, it has to be half to get half the vertices, right? Yeah. So, for example, uh, alpha and yes. half, and I look at the final matrix, I come right. So, mm -hmm. it will be, uh, for example, an n by n matrix. Okay. Uh, a 100 by 100 matrix, and if you look at the first 50 rows and columns, you will see a diagonal. Uh, the the identity matrix. Well, here we, there will be a, an identity matrix, so this will be this is always an identity matrix and zeros. Okay. So, ah, so it's so 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 so, it, okay, okay. so in the on the fine graph you computed the frequency response with uh, with two hundred uh, frequency coefficients. You zeroed the highest uh, one hundred. You are left with the one hundred lowest frequencies. Yeah. With that, you basically produce the spatial realization of the frequency, it will be smooth, right? A bad limited approximation, and then you subsample. Okay? So question is striding or just cut off the high frequency? Well so it, so this is striding, right? And this is cutting off the high frequency. You need both. 
this is the this is the formal relation between the so two relations. Not taking all the frequencies. Well, beside this is the relation. Part. This is uh, max pooling. Yeah. Yeah. No, so it's not it's uh, so it's not max pooling. This is this is the way uh, you do striding, right? But you can of course define different types of pooling operations in this in this way, right? But does it make any sense to be striding on frequency? Well, it's not striding on frequency. This is basically so all this construction. The idea of this construction is to do is to do striding in a space domain. Okay. Now, since our convolution is defined in frequency, I'm trying to understand how striding in, in the space domain okay. is manifested in frequency. And this is the way it is manifested in frequency. Okay. So, so the way I have to now to do here. So let's rewrite this convolutional layer now when we have the striding. I will put a truncated basis here, so this k means that k will be, basically this will be my k, okay? I would have a smaller number of lowest frequencies, so it's a truncated basis, it is a very limited approximation in the signal processing, uh, uh, in the signal processing uh, jargon. Uh, this matrix now will be k by k, so just, again, the lowest frequencies, and this will be also okay. okay. And basically this will will be of course a layer that now the output will be defined on the course in yes. This is for the opus <coughs> over the uh, light first. And then you uh, subsample it just to um, just to not get like a, a situation of everything that's well, so the reason, so I, I would love to do everything here, continue basically stacking the layers in the frequency domain, right? So it will be just a concatenation of the matrices, reducing and reducing the matrices. However, I have this nonlinearity which is applied in space, not in frequency. So I must synthesize my signal before applying the nonlinearity. And then again, analyze it, synthesize it, apply nonlinearity, and oh, repeat so multiple times. According to the number of layers. Oh, every layer? Do you have to yes. go back to the Yes, yeah. unfortunately. Right? Because the, because the nonlinearity is, is performed in space. Not is there no way to define the nonlinearity in the frequency domain? Well, not, uh, not that I'm aware of. It has a completely different thing. So if you want to mimic at least, if you want to mimic the action of a CNN, you need to apply the nonlinearity in the space. Okay? Now, uh, Let's try to let's try to understand the complexity, the, the computational complexity of uh, of this uh, of this construction. Okay. So first of all, we have this number of degrees of freedom. Instead of k, instead of n, I will have k here. Let's let's assume that we have this. K is of the order of n, right? It depends on the size of the domain. That's not good because I will for very big domains I will have zillions of parameters, and I will. I'm likely to overfit uh, because of such such a big number of degrees of freedom. So I would like to keep the number of degrees of freedom independent of the domain size, at least if I want to mimic the same uh, features, the same good features that I have in, in uh, regular convolutional neural networks on Euclidean domains. Another thing, let's see the computational complexity. So first of all, it takes me some time to find the identity composition of the Laplacian, but let's let's forget about this. Let's say that it is given together with my domain. So I worked offline, I spent my time to compute the first k eigen, uh, eigenfunctions, eigenvectors of the, of the Laplacian, and then I stored this matrix aside. The multiplication by this matrix is k squared, right? Or n by k, right? Now, in the Euclidean domain, first in the Euclidean domain, we need convolution in the spatial. If we worked in frequency, we could use f of t. But the projection of the Fourier basis and on its adjoint, on the basically doing the inverse transform, can be done in n log n instead of n squared. And that was possible because of this nice grid structure of the Euclidean domain. Unfortunately, there is no such a thing as a, as a fast Fourier transform uh, on general non Euclidean domains. So now it, it becomes painful, right? So this n squared complexity is a showstopper for big domains. It doesn't scale. Yes. Oh, some Pardon? For some non -Euclidean. Well, I mean, for a general domain, non-Euclidean non -Euclidean domain, you don't have a 15. Of course, for some non-Euclidean domains where you have a group structure, you might have some equivalent of, uh, of an 15. Yes. Uh, 
If you take a general graph, uh, there is simply no way to construct anything that looks like it. It, it requires a lot of structure, right? And usually the graph is an unstructured. So, so basically, no way. So, so basically, at this point, I think it is quite. So, basically, all this construction is pretty limited, right? Facebook graphs that I don't know how many billions of, of nodes. And, and squared is simply is simply irrelevant for for such such scale. And squared would be irrelevant for one one hundred thousand nodes. So basically, we need to do something different. Okay, we need to, to do something different. But before we before we go there, so basically, we have two two points to address. One is this point, right? Is this the number of degrees of freedom? We want to get rid of the size of the domain in this uh, in this uh, in this number. And second, we want to get rid of the n squared complexity in computing the Fourier transform. Okay, so let's first address. The first issue, the number of degrees of freedom, and then address the second, the, uh, the, the computational complexity of the transform. Okay, so first, uh, remember that. So why why did we have such a small and domain size independent number of degrees of freedom in a regular scene? Well, the way we defined our degrees of freedom, we, we demanded that our filters are spatially localized, right? Let's say it's three by three filter is spatially localized. So by demanding special localization, we cannot, so if we demand special localization, it will necessarily impose some constraints on the frequency itself, right? So I can equivalently, because we know that there is an equivalence between the standard basis and the Fourier basis, representation of the convolution of the complex operator. So if I have only nine degrees of freedom in representing uh, my operator in, uh, in the space domain, there must be definitely some kind of constraints that restrict my n degrees of freedom to nine, right? In the, in the Euclidean domain. So let's see how exactly uh, spatial localization is manifested in frequency, okay? So let's start with the Euclidean case, but exactly the same will apply to, to the non-Euclidean case. So let's start with my kernel W. Let, let's say the one dimensional case. Of course, the, of course the, the uh, D dimensional case will be exactly the same. Okay, I would like to claim that this thing is localized in space. So how can I how can I mathematically formulate it? So let's compute what is called a fifth order moment. Let's say let's start with, with a square. So the moment will be given by by this sum. of i to the power 2p times wi squared. But instead of i, let me write k, because i is also a complex unit that I'm going to use with k. Okay, so basically, this is a polynomial. Or this is a definition? Well, well this is a definition of the moment. Okay. Let me define it this way. Okay. Maybe it's a little bit, a little bit non-standard because I'm putting putting the power two here, but it's just for convenience because basically what is written here is just the L2 norm squared of k to the power to the power p element-wise product with W. Okay, basically a product of the squared norm of of a product of two c. Okay. Now basically. The higher, the higher is this power, the faster this signal grows, okay? And if I, want the, if I want my kernel to be localized, I want these numbers to be small for as high, or, uh, as high p as possible, right? It means that my kernel decays faster than, uh, than uh, something to the power p. Let's say p is 20, something faster than a power of 20, which means that I have a very fast Decay in space. Okay? Make sense? Let's see how this is manifested in frequency because this is what I care about. Now, by of course by Percival's identity, this will be this will be equal to the L2 norm squared of the Fourier transform of basically this product. Right? 
and it will be dealt to norm to zero one, the space where the creation form is defined. Okay? This is Percival's identity, a consequence of the fact that the free atom form is a unit identity. Now let's compute this. Of course, those of you who know properties of the free atom form will immediately see that this, this is a unit of the free atom form, but let's let's see it explicitly. So if I take the derivative of the Fourier transform. If I take the derivative of the Fourier transform of, uh, let me take the derivative of the Fourier transform of W, okay, with respect to the frequency term. So let's write it explicitly. It's the derivative of sum on K of wk e to the power minus 2 pi i psi k. Okay, i is the is the complex series. Okay, the derivative here will leave will leave minus 2 pi i k. K will remain in the, in the sum. Okay, so minus 2 pi i doesn't depend on the sum. Uh, sum over k k wk e to the power of minus 2 pi i psi k. Okay, which is of course the Fourier transform of k wk. Okay? Or I can summarize it uh, the way we the way we did so I can do it multiple times. If I do it multiple times, if I do it three times. I can write that uh, k to the power p times wk becomes, in the frequency domain, becomes i over 2 pi, I'm just dividing here, uh, times, um, times the, the p or the derivative with respect to psi of w. Okay. And the minus disappear because I have i in the numerator instead of the Okay. So now we basically quit with this. What I can write, I can immediately write this identity here. It will be uh, one over two pi to the power two p integral of over one zero of the absolute value of the derivative to the power to the derivative squared, of course, the psi, uh, the piece or the derivative of the Fourier transform. Okay? Make sense? So essentially, localization, so basically, the more localization I have in the special domain, what does it mean that I would like the integral of uh, high powers, basically high derivatives of the of my transform to be low? So if the derivatives of the transform, remember the derivatives govern the Taylor expansion, right? So if the derivatives are small, let's say equal to zero, yeah. it means that this thing, uh, this thing is orthogonal to a subspace of polynomials up. Uh, up to order p, right? Basically, it has zero projection on this space of polynomials. So it means that it is very smooth. It means that my Fourier transform behaves very smooth. So special localization in the frequency domains means smoothness. So the more I'm localized in space, the more the smoother is my Fourier transform. Okay, and smoothness is again described in this way. Now remember that these are two opposite properties. If I want to be smooth, I cannot be localized. Okay? Because basically smoothness means that the function changes very slow. And basically this is the, the, the consequence of this observation is called the Heisenberg un uncertainty principle. So I cannot be simultaneously localized both in space and in physics. Okay? And basically there are, there are different physical quantities that are dual in the sense that one is the Fourier transform of the other, for example, uh, location and momentum of the quantum, of the quantum uh, system. So, uh, if I know how to localize it in, in space, I don't know how to localize its momentum. 
and this is basically a fundamental limitation of the nature. It's not something that we simply don't know. We still haven't invented a system to measure, for example, uh, time and frequency equally well. So, for example, if I play a musical note uh, on the left part of the keyboard, it has very low frequency, so I need a very long time. Uh, so basically, it ch changes very slowly, and I can, I can, I have a very good resolution of the frequency, but I don't know where exactly it's happened in time. On the other hand, a high pitch looks like a click, so I don't know exactly how it looks like in frequency, but I know where exactly it happens in time. Okay, so it, it, again, this is a fundamental uh, trade-off between localization in, in, in space and in frequency. Okay. But anyway, so we know how to translate localization into the frequency domain in the Euclidean case. We can do exactly the same in the non-Euclidean case. So what we will, will what we will simply demand, we will demand that our uh, frequency representation of the kernel will be smooth in the frequency domain. So the way we can do it, we'll just define its values at some small number of points and we'll interpolate with some smooth interpolation kernel in between. For example, let's take some, some cubic splines to interpolate. Cubic splines are smooth, right? Because they, these are, these are nice, uh, nicely behaving polynomials. Uh, or we can do, take any other smooth, uh, smooth interpolation kernel for that purpose. So again, we are specifying a very small number of points in the frequency domain. And so we are specifying the values of the kernel at a small number of frequencies. The rest is interpolated. So in this way, we can keep the number of degrees of freedom small. Okay. Now let's try to, to take it into the non-Euclidean domain. And we, immediately we have an issue. Because in order to define smoothness in the spectrum, in the frequency domain, we need some kind of a geometry in the, in, in the spectrum, right? So in the Euclidean case, we have this basis function. So we have phi psi and phi psi prime, right? These are, of course, defined as e to the power, of, uh, to the power 2 pi i psi transpose x. And this is e to the power 2 pi i psi, trans, psi prime transpose x. And we can say that uh, these two, this is without the minus. The minus comes from the input. Okay? And we can say that basically, well, they are similar, that the degree of the similarity of these two eigenfunctions <coughs> is governed by the distance between the two frequencies psi and psi prime, right? So this is a very trivial Euclidean geometry that we have in the spectrum. Uh, of the Euclidean Fourier transform, right? Now, if we now have two eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, phi i and phi j, what is exactly the degree of their similarity, right? So if you want to be completely formal, we would like to define some dual graph with the weights w i j determining how phi i and phi j are similar, okay? And actually, the, the, this is an interesting and and very scarcely answered question, basically, how to construct such a dual graph, the smoothness on which, and there is a way to define smoothness, so using the Laplacian, for example, using some diffusion operator. So we construct a dual graph, the smoothness of which translates to maximal localization on the prime graph from which it was constructed. So this is an open question. However, at least for some cases, for some classes of graphs, these ways can simply be given by the distance between the corresponding eigenvalues. How do these weights manage the smoothness? What do you mean? You talk about the weights. Okay, okay, so so when so once you have a graph, you can define smoothness on uh, on a graph, for example, by uh, for example by defining a diffusion operator. So you take uh, let's say the exponential of the uh, the negative exponential of the Laplacian and you define the heat kernel. So the heat kernel the the, the the basically, the, the smaller is the bandwidth of this kernel, the smoother is the, is the resulting uh, result signal. Okay, but how does this relate to the dual graph you just mentioned? Well, so once, so, once, so once you have a dual graph, you can, for example, compute the Laplacian on this graph, some kind of a dual Laplacian, right? And you can, uh, you can use that Laplacian to construct a diffusion operator that will define what is smooth and what is not smooth. For example, you can define the Dirichlet energy on the graph, right? And it will it will tell you how, uh, uh, basically, how smooth is your function by taking this Dirichlet model. So th there, there are formal ways to, to define the smoothness of this on this uh, on this dual graph. And what is really unanswered is how to construct this graph 
the smoothness on which will translate into localization on the prime graph from which it is derived. But basically, if you construct it this way, you will get reasonable localization on many types of graphs. At least, it will definitely work well on low dimensional graphs. On high dimensional graphs, it's very difficult to predict what will happen. So basically, if we define, if we define our geometry essentially of the spectrum in this way, what we can do next is let's take some basis functions, some smooth basis basis functions on a real line, because now we are working with the geometry of a real line. So let's take a collection of basis functions. Let's call them beta. Remember how I denoted it? Uh, beta s, okay. some index s functions on la of lambda. Okay, so these are basis functions, and I will simply combine them. Uh, I will sample them. I will sample them at my eigen eigenvalues that uh, I obtained from the decomposition eigen composition of the Laplacian, and we'll we'll call these the elements of my matrix B. Okay, so S, let's say, goes from 1 to Q, and R, of course, goes to one, from 1 to K. K is the number of uh, frequencies that I'm retaining in my convolutional layer. Okay? So now I can, now I can define, uh, so now I can define my spectral weights W as B times some vector alpha interpolation coefficient. So alpha is a vector in RQ, okay? And of course, W is a vector in RK. And then I, def then I construct my matrix by simply, simply, taking, simply taking these weights on, on its diagonal. Okay, so this, this will be my filter. So it is parameterized by Q coefficients that are interpolated into K coefficients, okay? And Q, I, I would like basically to keep my Q uh, of the order of one independent on the size of the domain in order to have a small number of degrees of freedom. So Q will be some fixed small number independent of the size of the domain. Okay? And of course then, of course then uh, I'm doing it for every, let's call it WIJ in my convolutional So I basically, I parameterize my spectral, uh, spectral characterization, my frequency response of the convolutional layer by a small fixed domain size independent uh, number of interpolation coefficients. Okay, and this was, this amounted to imposing smoothness and hence smoothness in the in spectrum, hence localization in, in the space of the, uh, of the filter. Okay, so this addressed the issue with the uh, with the uh, number of degrees of freedom. Now, what about the computational complexity? You lose a lot of information. These things. Why? Well. Well, of course, I restricted, I greatly restricted the class of filters that I'm willing to accept, right? But I did it the same way in, the, in my Euclidean construction. Instead of having all possible filters, I, I was just looking, for example, uh, at the cases of 3 by 3 filters. So it greatly reduces the space of all possible filters. Same story here, but I'm just expressing it in the frequency. Okay? Because frequency is the only thing I can do. So it's not losing information, it's just a smaller filter. It, it corresponds to a smaller filter. It is basically a better localized filter. Okay, so let's, I will now make this localization explicit. Okay, so currently it's not explicit. It was just to prove that relation between the powers of the, basically the, the, the fifth moment in space and the high order derivative in frequency. Okay, so let's make this localization explicit now. And going back to the question of the, uh, to, to the question of the computational complexity. So again, I'm looking at this filter. I'm looking at this filter. Okay. 
So this filter has now a smaller number of degrees of freedom because I substituted inside. Let's, let's put K, okay? just using the truncated uh, identities. I have here the I R E, what is written here, B alpha. I'm ignoring the I J indices. It's just one filter. Okay? The discussion will, will, of course, be valid to all the filters in the layer. So computing this explicitly is painful because of the of the multiplication of these matrices. And it's, it's painful in the forward pass, it is equally painful in the backward pass. Because basically these two matrices, uh, the, pro the product with them is nk, right? And I want to get rid of this, uh, of this quadratic complex. So let's write this B alpha explicit. Okay, so let me write it like this. It will be phi k. I would have here a sum on i of di lambda 1, lambda 1, alpha i, it's a diagonal matrix, alpha bi lambda k alpha times phi k. Okay? And I just substituted what is written here into the definition of, of my filter. Okay? Now let me let me write let me denote this. Let me denote this as a polynomial B lambda, sample of the lambda k. So B lambda B lambda is a polynomial, right? So suppose suppose these betas, for example, are cubic splines. So these are polynomials of some low degree, let's say degree three of cubic spline. So let me write this polynomial explicitly. I will be using different coefficients. Let's say i runs from zero to some degree r. This is the highest power of the polynomial. Let's write it as uh, lambda to the power i, some coefficient gamma. Okay. A polynomial. Okay. Now, if I take, if I take my Laplacian, if I take my Laplacian written in this way, Laplacian written as phi lambda phi transpose. Okay. So let's. So this is a polynomial for numbers, right? I can substitute the number there and get. It's a, it's a function of a scalar. Right? So let's rewrite this polynomial as a matrix polynomial. The Laplacian is a matrix. I can define I can define B of delta by simply these are integer powers of the matrix. I can always take the, uh, take integer powers of the matrix, right? So it will be delta to the power i times the coefficient gamma. Okay. Now what what is what is the i's power of this Laplace. Let's, let's compute it explicitly. Delta to the power i, I will substitute this i times, right? So it is phi lambda phi transpose i times by phi lambda phi transpose. Okay, so this is, this is done i times. Now, what, what, will happen, uh, what will happen with the product between phi transpose and phi? It will cancel out. So here, I am removing this k and assuming that the support of the polynomial for lambda greater than lambda k is simple. It's very simple, right? It's nicer to write it this way. So basically, all these will, will cancel each other, will become identity because of the unitarity of the, of the basis, or normality of the basis. And I will get phi lambda to the power i Phi transpose, right? Which can be written as phi lambda one to the power i until lambda n to the power i phi transpose, right? And now, if I need to evaluate the polynomial, I can write it this way as well, right? So it will be phi b of lambda one 
until b of lambda n phi trans. Okay? And actually, again, define this as applying any function to any matrix, right? So how do I apply, for example, an exponential to a matrix? I apply the exponential to the eigenvalues and then compose it back, right? And this is a very meaningful definition of a function applied to a matrix. Potentially, uh, this is a completely different operation compared, for example, to applying a function element y. Okay, so this, this is how functions should be applied to a matrix or to an operator. And in this case, this is an application of the polynomial. Yes? Uh, if you're a representation of the Laplace Okay, so we, we, I, in the beginning, I, I, I insisted that I want to deal with un undirected graphs. Okay, exactly for this. I want the function to be symmetric. I want the step to be real. There are ways to deal with directed graphs, but it complicates a lot. Under. Okay? So basically, let's now get back to what we have here. So what is written here is just the application of this function to the Laplace, right? So instead of writing it this way, this is complicated. Writing it in frequency requires quadratic complexity, right? Because I need to multiply by this basis function. So let me write this simply as sum over i, beta i, uh, Laplacian times alpha i. Okay, and remember these are polynomials. Okay, so basically I'm taking a few powers of the Laplacian, uh, combining these operators with some weights, and I get a new operator. Now, remember how the Laplacian was defined. The Laplacian was a local operator. It was averaging on one rings in the graph. So I'm looking at my vertex, at my directly connected neighbors, right? And doing some averaging with, with, the, with the edge uh, weights and the vertex weights that were defined in the graph, right? So what would be the second power, the, the, the square of the Laplacian? How will it look like in terms of my action on the graph? Two ring, right? What is the what is the pth power? It's a p ring, right? It's a p ring. So basically, it's a small, some basically some small neighbor. Still, some I'm still spatially localized. If I'm taking a small power of the Laplacian, I'm still I'm still spatially localized. Okay. So here the the localization is explicit. Right? So I cannot hop farther than the highest power of my polynomial, right? So basically I'm localized on the graph, which is nice, right? Before we just have this implicit connection to localization, now it is explicit. What Another is thing, it? yes? Well, but what was uh, actually legal to say that it's polynomial? <coughs> well, well I, I, first of all, I, I, I told that I can do it for any function, but we assume that, that these betas were, for example, cu cubic square. Some, some some smooth polynomial. Okay. Actually, the standard con construction uses Chebyshev of polynomial, which, which is also valid. Set of polynomials, still low power, everything is specially low power. Okay. You can put any polynomials you decide. Just, just keep the powers low, uh, otherwise you will basically spread over all the graph. So this actually this works well for graphs of low dimension, where basically uh, in a, in a low dimensional graph, the, the Laplacian has this property that each row has, uh, has an O1 number of non zero elements. Okay? It means that basically uh, your directly connected neighbors are significant, significantly smaller in their number than the entire size of the graph. When you have a high dimensional graph, basically you have this so called small world phenomenon that where everything is connected to everything by a very, by very short paths. So in that case, basically, you don't get too much uh, benefit in, in reducing the complexity. But in the, in the case where the Laplacian is a very sparse matrix, uh, <coughs> taking its low power will still keep it sparse. And multiplying by these, by these operators will still give you something computationally very, uh, very efficient. Basically, you're going to work on some uh, some local uh, p rings or we call it r, r rings uh, of the graph, which which is just a local operation. Okay, so basically we can plug this definition into our definition of the convolutional layer. Okay, we are just taking powers of the Laplacian uh, blended with some weights, and these weights are not. Okay, 
So this is probably the closest we can get to uh, to all the properties that we that we desired from the convolutional neural network that we had in the uh, in the Euclidean domain. Of course, here the exact structure of the filter changes where we shift it from one location on the graph to another, but it is still spatially localized. It has all the nice uh, properties of the CNN in terms of the number of degrees of freedom. Okay? And it has reasonable computation. Any questions? Yes? Um, so the CNN is So even if you take the geometric corpus and let's say, uh, let's say you discretize your corpus and you find it at so tangent weight right? yeah. uh, on the edges and, and uh, discrete area weights on the, on the vertices. It still will be one way. So okay, so the, power, the, the piece power will be a theory. Yeah, but with, with, with some shape, some, so at every vertex it will be a differently shaped filter, but it will still work on theory in this right? But this is not the desired property. Why not? Because if you imagine what you would like to, to achieve, okay, you would okay, like so to achieve a filter that uh, you have some radius around the vertex. You don't sure, want sure. To, to, to be dependent on the position or something like that. I see, I see. So, so, so basically, you would, you would like, so if you're talking about discretizing manifolds, and you would like to be, to, be, to be invariant to sampling, to variable sampling density of yeah, the manifold. The Laplacian, not okay. the Laplacian, you want the, the okay. field of some meaning, some metric. Sure, sure, sure. So, so first of all, so first of this meaning, this metric will come from the geometric construction of the Laplacian itself, right? Now, uh, since this is a two or let's say three dimensional manifold, it has, it basically doesn't suffer from this first dimensionality from the small world phenomenon, right? So you can take bigger uh, rings and still get reasonable computational complexity. So take, take a bigger ring, let's say 10 pops, something like that. With only, only few basically, your your invariance for sampling would come from the geometric construction of the low class cell, and you would have a wide support enough to uh, to deal with uh, with variable samples. So the solution is to widen the yes, the, yes, the, yes. The, the, have the no choice. Free, but then you suffer from the complexity. It will not be huge. It will not be huge. again it depends on how that you Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Well, so, so basically, this, this probably this is a slightly slightly more exotic uh, uh, topic for 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 our specific context. But basically, one of the ways to construct so we have seen that there is no just a single graph of plus. There are basically there is a family of operators that can be called graph of graph of plus. And I told you in two or three. And uh, one of the ways to construct a Laplacian on the graph, basically to think of the graph as a discretization of some smooth manifold. Okay? And then, of course, the weights of the Laplacian, we have two sets of weights, edge weights and vertex weights. Then the weights should, should basically somehow be uh, derived from the metric of the manifold. Right? And, the, and you would like this operator, for example, to be convergent in the sense that if you solve, let's say, some PDE with these discretized Laplacian, when the sampling density goes to infinity, then you get uh, you get a uh, solution that converges in some sense to the continuous so, right? To the Laplace of the Okay. So basically, you would, you would like you would like your discretization of the operator to be consistent with some smooth, some continuous counterpart, right? The way you, for example, discretize ligands by finite difference. You would like when you would like when the radius of the discretization goes to, goes to zero. You would like your finite difference operator to, to converge to the minimum. Right? So you would like to remain the same for, for the Laplacian, for the single Laplacian when you deal with manifolds. Now, the manifold can be sampled in some crazy way. You might have a, a very densely sampled uh, uh, region here and very scarcely sampled region here. So let's say you sample according to the curvature, something like that. Now, you would like to be insensitive 
to, to some extent to this sampling. So you would like basically your sensitivity to the sampling be more or less bounded by the sampling radius. So when you, the sampling radius goes to zero, you converge to the continuous operator, right? This is, I mean, this is a very reasonable demand for doing everything discrete. When your discrete is a discretization of something. Now, if you want to construct, uh, to construct such a little there are, there are schemes that take the geometry into account. For example, the very famous scheme is finite elements. When you do uh, linear finite elements, first order finite elements, you get what is called the cotangent vector plus sense. The, the uh, edge, uh, edge weights will be dependent on the cotangents of the angles that triangles in your discretization of the domain form around every edge. I mean, this is a standard construction of the plus sense. Okay, so, so uh, what I suggest, so if, uh, unless there are any other questions, let's, let's move to the next topic. So the, the next two hours, uh, time will, be, will start talking about uh, some hardware-related issues, basically how to, how to run neural networks in, uh, on, real, on real hardware. And one of the, one of the uh, aspects of real hardware is when you, when you do convolutions, and let's talk about Euclidean domains for now. When you do convolutions, you need to perform a, an elementary operation that is called multiply and accumulate. This is how convolutions is. Now, multiply and accumulate uh, is performed on words, on basically numbers, represented in certain bit width, basically a certain length of the word, certain kind of arithmetic. And basically, we'll see how, for example, how to introduce low precision arithmetics, how to quantize these operations to save silicon size or computational uh, complexity or uh, power of the chip in which it is going to, to be implemented. So there are very interesting trade-offs and considerations when, uh, when you actually run these things on the other. Okay, so this is, this is going to be the topic of the next, the next one.